Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to The Elephant in the Room, Talking Race in Any Space. This is a tricky conversation for us in Wisconsin as well as in the United States. So first, my colleagues and I that are here presenting with you want to thank you for coming to this session and leaning into this conversation. We understand that it can be a little, uh, not such a good feeling conversation, but we want to encourage you to hold space for the ideas that we are presenting today, and that it is um, equally as um, challenging on both sides of the aisle. So please uh, stay with us, and uh, let's learn together on behalf of the children that we serve in this state. We owe them our ability to get better and better at this conversation. So my name is Kathy Miles. I'm the um, coaching coordinator for the state of Wisconsin. I work with my colleague Heidi Lobbs. We travel the state um, doing leadership and coaching sessions. And I am here with? My name is Andrea L. Davis. I'm the culturally responsive practices coordinator for the state of Wisconsin with the Wisconsin RTI Center. And I'm Shavanna Talbert. I serve as district equity coach for Fond du Lac School District. Thank you. So this needs to be on. So here's our agenda for today. We have, um, this is an assessment driven session, so we are using the TFI as our base, and we're gonna talk about the areas that that aligns with, as well as we wanna talk to, with you about some indicators that we need to be aware of when we're thinking about talking race in our schools and in our district, so we're gonna use the model to inform, and we're gonna use some work by a gentleman named um, Daryl Wing Su, Dr. Su, and his research, and then we're gonna share some protocols with you, and we'll explain to you why we came to this conversation with the idea of protocols. So our assessment connections that go with the TFI are in tiers one and tier two, and it's around our team operating procedures, around how we involve faculty, and uh, actually access that students have to tier one supports. The more honest that we can be in our conversations, the more productive we can be, the more collaborative we can be, the better we can serve our students. So now Andrella is gonna speak with you about the model to inform. This morning we heard our state superintendent speak with us and she talked about how we're very unique in many ways. We also heard from Heather George and she also reiterated some of those same messages. And one of the things that makes us special in our work is that as a state, we have a culturally responsive practices model that we can follow and that can help us on our journey. With the culturally responsive practices model, as you'll see on the screen, it has three arrows around the outer circle of the model. The first arrow is yellow and it describes our desire to lead this work and even be involved in this work. And so when we look at that piece, we talk about the will of the work. When we move into the blue arrow of the work, we talk about gaining cultural knowledge or field building work that, so that we can get to know our students and families on a deeper level. And then the skill building work is where most people would like to go immediately, applying um, practice, applying the knowledge that they've learned. And you can see that the arrows are fluid. So we say that this is a journey, not a destination. We begin with becoming self-aware. And when we talk about becoming self-aware, we know that we have to start with ourselves and think about our own culture, about our values, about our belief systems, and about what we bring to the learning environment that impacts outcomes. We then move into examining the system's impact on students and families. This is where we delve into our data and we really begin to look at some of those populations that were talked about earlier today again by our state superintendent. EL students, students with disabilities, students who are experiencing poverty, um, students of color. And then we move into believing all students will learn. What does that look like? How do we help students and families know that we believe they can learn, that we are validating and affirming what they bring to the learning environment? When we move into the field building work more deeply, we're really talking about how do we demonstrate that we understand all students and families have unique identities and worldviews just as we do? And how do we bridge what might be some of those gaps so that we can come together and ultimately achieve the goal that we want to eliminate those gaps? We also look at knowing the community in the field building area. In our training, we talk about 
um, mapping, community mapping, what's available in the community, what's not available in the community, um, who are role models in the community, what are organizations that we can partner with and, and take information from so that we can achieve our goal, sort of a, a village approach. And then we also move into the green area again, the skill building, and we're talking about leading, modeling, and advocating. And that's what many of you are here today doing. You're taking steps. Some of you are a little further on your journey. Some of you are taking the first step in learning what does it mean to lead, model, and advocate for equity practices, and what are some tools and resources that we can share with you as you move along your journey. Accepting institutional responsibility, we talk about moving from knowing to doing. So we've gathered all of this information, we've learned about these different tools. What are we going to do with that um, information and how are we going to use it? And then again, ultimately looking at using a curriculum and practices that honor the students and families that we serve. So I want you all to repeat after me, say, we'll feel skill. We'll feel skill. We'll feel skill. We'll feel skill. Be proud that you have a model that we can, again, help guide us on our collective journey. So what does the model to inform do for us? The model to inform helps us with our beliefs, with our knowledge, with our practices, so that we can reach and teach diverse learners. This is our second opportunity to um, present this information. We had the opportunity to do it at, the se at a session last year. We got a lot of good feedback from it, which was encouraging to us. Um, but as I think back to how we came to this space, we decided to try the work of protocols when we're having a difficult conversation like race. So why protocols? If you will, imagine with me a highway and we have guardrails on that highway. The guardrails are what the protocols allow. But also when you think about a highway, they go on and on. So we continue to have the opportunity to build our skills around the use of protocols, around the use of talking race, but it gives us the opportunity to not go off the road, right? That's what protocols do for us. They keep us contained by giving us a structured process and some guidelines to promote meaningful, efficient communication problem solving and learning. It also allows time for active listening and reflection so that we can hear, so that you can hear what I have to say and I can hear what you have to say, but then we can also take a step back and become more objective and reflect on the conversations that we've had and so that we can ensure that all voices in the group are heard and honored. That allows for equity of voice and it helps us to develop an understanding of different perspectives. And then finally, it helps us to build the skills and the culture necessary for productive and collaborative work. So when you think about the multi-level system of support, the big part of it, it has high quality instruction, balanced assessment, and collaboration. Our ability to collaborate as adults around a topic as heavy and emotion laden sometimes as race can be, will allow us to be more collaborative around high quality instruction, around balanced assessment, et cetera, which is why equity is at the center of that model. This is from the National School Reform faculty. This is their definition that we have shared with you. And so when you think about trying to take this work back into your school or district, this is a great resource for you to use, as well as we gave you a handout from the National School Reform faculty around comparing productivity and collaboration. And it really talks about the difference between meetings with protocols and meetings without protocols. And we want to be clear that we are talking about using protocols to talk about race. And I'm gonna, my next slide will explain that. But certainly, if you want to increase productivity and collaboration within your organization, protocols help with that. To become skilled at using them can help facilitate your movement as, you, your movement as a district or a school. So our objectives for using protocols when we are talking about conflict are simply because, one, we want to make sure the environment is safe. This stuff is already hard enough. As I said before, it has emotion tied to it. So we say to people, we're going to talk about this, but we're going to do it in a structured process. We're going to make sure that people have a safe space to speak and also to be heard which is important. So it talks about building capacity to respond productively to conflict and discomfort. 
and we're going to share some protocols with you, and you will hear, especially like Shavanna's going to give you a, a real-life example, and you'll hear her talking about how she moved through the protocol as she's sharing that with you. And then also we use a protocol to mind the conflict. A lot of times when we have a topic like race that comes up, our tendency is to step back and disengage. And really what we want to learn to do on behalf of our students is how to work through that conflict to mine through it. And protocols will help you do that, as well as the debrief or process afterward. And this I can't stress enough. In our schools and our districts, we say we run out of time. And a lot of times when we're using protocols, this is a step that is often overlooked. But you really want to take time to do some metacognition work, to talk as a group, to, con to decide what you want to continue to do, what worked, what didn't work. So debriefing is a key, key part of using protocols. So I'd like you right now to take a moment, turn to an elbow partner, and share what you know about using protocols. Just talk about the successes you, you have experienced with them and the challenges. Um, try to go with pairs, because we're only going to give you a couple minutes if you have a threesome, that's fine, but just know that you have to talk a little bit less, okay? So I'll give you 30 seconds of think time before you start talking. I'll give you 30 seconds. You can kind of plan out what you want to say. And then you can have your discussion. What successes and challenges have you experienced? And we'll be back in two minutes. Please wrap up your conversation. Thank you very much. Our ability to engage in protocols is a decision that we make as educators, whether we opt in or opt out. So just um, as we set a little background for you on this, please know for this to be successful, you have to determine to lean in, just like you showed up today. So now we're going to look at a little bit of research. And remember, I said this gets a little sticky, so just roll with me. Give me some space. I'm happy to talk with you afterwards if we need to. We um, are looking at the, a work, the work from a gentleman named um, Dr. Daryl Wing Su, who wrote this book a couple of years ago called Race Talk and the Conspiracy of Silence, Understanding and Facilitating Difficult Dialogues on Race. This is certainly just one resource, and this is just one conference session, so there's plenty more resources out there. But he has two big ideas I want to share with you today. The first one that he says um, is around three reasons it's hard to talk about race. He talks about these three protocols, which are just really, he calls them protocols, and we're using, we're over protocoling the word protocol these days, but <laughs> he is really saying it, it's the way that we show up, okay? So the very first one is the politeness protocol. It's just rude to be in, in common conversation, like at a cocktail party or, you know, sitting around with friends and start talking about something like race. It's just not polite conversation. It's not what you do. So we try to be polite. It's not how we are in our society. So that's one barrier. A second one is academic protocol. And he talks about the fact that many conversations around race, one, are laden with emotions. 
And when we think about academia, when we think about our college classrooms, there's no place for emotion in there. And then secondly, he also says that we tend to be more quantitative in our approach. So because we're more quantitative and me being a person of color sharing my experiences with you is gonna come across as more qualitative, so it can be viewed as more subjective so it's not counted as true research or experience. Does that make sense? So it doesn't have a place in academia. So that's a second barrier. And a third barrier that he talks about is this colorblind protocol. And I certainly remember a time in my career where we just said, everybody's the same. We don't need to make any differentiations. Everybody's the same, we're all good, we're just people. That is the colorblindness piece. And actually he talks about in his um, book and in articles that he has around that, is that organizations that have a colorblind philosophy tend to have more discrimination actually within their workplace than ones that acknowledge that people are, are different. So that's a thought. Now these aren't either ors, they can be ands, they can be ors, but these are three of the bigger barriers. This next one he talks about then are four internal barriers that make it hard for us to talk about this. And in his research analysis, he ta he's talking about you all, my colleagues, the majority of you in here, I mean, my white colleagues in education and why it is difficult to have these conversations. The first one is that if you start having this conversation, you might be misunderstood and then you're worried that you might actually appear racist. It's not what I meant, it's not how I said it, so it's just easier for me not to go there. If you think about an iceberg, this is really the top of the iceberg. So the next bullet is really under that iceberg. Even though it's an internal barrier, it's under that iceberg, and that's the possibility that you maybe do harbor biases, that you have done things that have been oppressive to other people, that you might actually think to yourself, oh, maybe I really am racist. And everybody gets up in the morning trying to do the best that they can, have moral um, obligations, want to help other people. So people aren't walking around wanting that particular label. So that's a fear. And then the third bullet here really gets at the fear of privilege. So if I'm acknowledging this and I'm having this conversation, then white privilege maybe really is a thing. And then therefore I have to acknowledge that and my role in it. And I have to tell you, this is interesting for me because I live in southeastern Wisconsin and there's actually a school district in my beloved state of Wisconsin where you cannot say privilege or white privilege within that um, school district. And um, I find that very interesting in this day and age and people actually have been told in that district we can say things like social justice or we can use that language but we can't use this language. So we do have a lot of work to do, but I'm happy that you're here because then we can at least start that or continue that conversation. And then the fourth internal barrier that Dr. Sue talks about is, if we do have these conversations and we acknowledge our own biases or things that we may have done intentionally or not, and we own the fact that white privilege is a thing, then we have to own up to our own biases and then that becomes a moral question. If I know better, my mother taught me to do better. So if I know that what I'm doing is causing other people, other you know, outcomes, then I have a, an obligation to try to work to stop it. So those are four barriers that he speaks to in his book around this conversation and why it can be so difficult for us to have. So now what we want to do is talk to you around the use of protocols. So that was just information for you to garner, to reflect on, to think about. And we are going to, we had a little bit of fun with numbers here. So we're gonna share some protocols with you. There are five of them. And we're gonna share the four agreements by Glenn Singleton. We're gonna share the five guidelines for resolving cultural conflicts by Sonia Whitaker. We are going to share six strategies for managing unhealthy conflict. We couldn't come up with a seven or an eight, so there's another six. We're gonna share the six conditions by Glenn Singleton that actually goes with the four agreements. And then we're gonna end with some work by Lee Moon Wa, who's out of California, around the nine healthy ways to communicate. So is gonna come on up and get us started with the four agreements. While I was practicing, um, I did find the eight. And if you go back to the model to inform, there are eight sections on the model to inform. So we have to add that the next time. We do have a number eight, Kathy. <laughs> so I am um, going to share with you our um, number four protocol or tool 
And the four agreements from the Pacific Education Group are what we chose to share with you today. Those are um, also uh, have been introduced to us and we've done a lot of work with uh, Glenn Singleton. Those four uh, agreements mimic what I um, consider for myself anchors. So Kathy talked about guardrails and these four agreements have been anchors. So um, early in my career here at the Wisconsin RTI Center, uh, because of my um, cultural communication styles and patterns, I really was not well bought into using the four agreements. But as I began to do my work as um, uh, training with the uh, Building Culturally Responsive Systems training, and we began to use the agreements, one day in our training, someone came up to me and they were very disgruntled about us not being able to uh, complete the activity that we were working on. And just right off the top of my head, like I was kind of playing the dozens or something, I just said, remember, expect and accept non-closure. And it was a life lifesaver. It was life changer. It was an aha moment for me that when you're doing this very difficult work and when you're having these courageous conversations, oftentimes you can't just walk into the situation without having protocols, without having tools, without having resources to help you be able to move through, again, what's going to be very difficult. And so we're going to introduce to you the four agreements and then we're gonna have you get up because we know you've been doing a lot of sit and get. So the first agreement is stay engaged. The second agreement is speak your truth. The third agreement is experience discomfort. And the fourth agreement is expect and accept non-closure. Now I've chosen people in the audience to help me go more deeply with what these actually mean. And so I'm going to ask the person who was chosen to speak more deeply on what does it mean to stay engaged, if you could please stand. And I'm going to give her the microphone so that everyone can hear. Stay engaged. Participants in courageous conversation must stay engaged. This is a personal commitment each person makes, regardless of the engagement of others. Staying engaged means remaining morally, emotionally, intellectually, and socially involved in the dialogue. To stay engaged is to not let your heart and mind check out of the conversation while leaving your body in place. Thank you, Melanie. Let's give her a round of applause. The second agreement is speak your truth. If you have speak your truth, please stand. Speaking your truth in courageous conversations about race requires a willingness to take risk. Speaking your truth means being absolutely honest about your thoughts, feelings, and opinions, and not just saying what you perceive others want to hear. Too often, we don't speak our truth out of the fear of offending, appearing angry, or sounding ignorant. But until we can become completely honest, the dialogue will remain limited and ultimately ineffective. Let's give Charmé a round of applause. And when we talk about speaking your truth, we actually have more um, in-depth conversation about how do you do that respectfully as well. How are you speaking your truth, but how are you doing that in a respectful way? Whoever has experienced discomfort, please stand. Um, experience discomfort. Because of the problematic state of racial conditions in our society, courageous conversations necessarily create discomfort for participants. Rather than experience the discomfort in interracial dialogue, people often put an emphasis on how we are all alike instead of addressing our obvious differences. Typical diversity trainings are focused around not getting partici participants upset or too uncomfortable. Traditional diversity training, however, has been unsuccessful in helping schools close the racial achievement gap. The courageous conversation strategy, on the other hand, asks participants to agree to experience discomfort so they can deal with the reality of race in an honest and forthright way. Thank you. Give her a round of applause. And the last one, expect and accept non-closure. Simply put, we cannot discover a solution to a challenge if we have not been able to talk about it. Furthermore, the magnitude 
complexity, and longevity of our racial struggle and strife in the United States rule out any possibility of discovering a quick fix. In this conversation, the solutions discovered are ever forming and ever changing. Therefore, participants must commit to an ongoing dialogue as an essential component of their action. This is how to manifest the agreement to expect and accept non-closure. And round of applause. Thank you so much to our readers. I really appreciate that. So we are, um, the other thing I wanted to say to you is that we have to think about the context in which we're using these agreements. And so if we're having a staff meeting, we might have a different feeling about a specific agreement than if we're having a deep conversation with race at the center of it. And so we have to think about our context for when we're, how we're using the agreements and what our reactions are to each of these four agreements as we think about that context. So we're going to give you some um, time to, like I promised, to move around to kind of uh, think about these four agreements and to go to that piece of the model that's around self-awareness. So we're going to be doing some self-awareness work with this activity that's coming up. And what we're going to ask you to do, you have seen um, there are uh, four, the four agreements are around our room. We have speak your truth in the, if I'm facing the front of the room, it's on the front left-hand side. And so people who are out there in our live stream world, we're going to ask you to also think about having your speak your truth in the front left-hand side of the room. We also are going to be looking at staying engaged or listening, listening fully with your ears and hearts and um, your eyes. And we're, so staying engaged will be at the front right of our room and we're going to ask our live stream friends to also place their staying, staying engaged at the front right. And then at the back of our room, we have, if I'm facing the back of the room, we have experienced discomfort or notice moments of discomfort. If I'm facing the back of the room, it is at the back left hand side of the room. And if I'm facing the, the back of the room, our um, being open to the experience and expecting and accepting non-closure is to the right hand side of our room in the back. So we want you all in the live stream world to place your four agreements in the same areas so everyone will, be, will know where they need to go. And what we're going to ask you to do is we're going to ask everyone in the, in the room physically in live stream room, which is the least challenging agreement for you? Think of a scenario or context or situation, which would be the least challenging for you? I'm gonna give you a couple of seconds to think about that. And then I'm going to ask you to Stand up, move to the agreement that is the least challenging for you, both in the physical space and the live stream world. Move to the agreement corner that is the least challenging for you. If you end up with a large group, super large group, break into two smaller groups in that corner. And we want you to have a conversation with your neighbors about why that particular agreement is least challenging for you. And we're going to give you three minutes for that. Go.
When I say bring it, you say back. Bring it. Bring it. Bring it. Way back. Thank your neighbors. <laughs> and I'm going to ask you to listen to the next set of directions. Now we're going to have you move to the section of the room that is most challenging for you, both in the physical space and in the live stream room. Please move to the corner of the room that has the agreement that you feel the most challenging. Go. When you arrive at that corner of the room, please begin to have a conversation with your neighbors about why you find that agreement most challenging. If you have a very large group, please break up into two smaller groups. When I say hold up, you say wait a minute. Hold up. Hold up. Let us put some courage in it. <laughs> Thank your partners. And you may return to your seats. As you make your way back to your seats, think about what you learned about yourself as you went through utilizing the four agreements. What type of self-awareness work were you able to do? And what did you learn that you can bring to 
to this very important work. So we talked about the four agreements and Shavana is going to lead us into talking about another piece of this protocol, another piece that goes along with the four agreements. She's going to be telling us and talking with us about the six conditions and also telling us and teaching us about how to use the compass. Awesome. Hi, everybody. I am so excited to be here. These are two of my favorite people, um, honestly. So thank you so much for being here today. Um, in the work that I do at Fond du Lac School District, we use um, a protocol by Glenn Singleton, Courageous Conversation Protocol. And you heard what Andreal described as the anchors for her, those four agreements. And if you haven't seen those before, um, or even if you have and you don't necessarily do, that's not what you do and what you live by, I would challenge you today to think about how can you infuse those four agreements into the work that you do every single day. And something that we do in Fond du Lac and, and many of the PLCs that we have is those are part of our norms or our community agreements or whatever it is that you call them in the spaces that you come together as staff. Think about how you can work those four anchors into what you do in your building, in your district, because those are really, really important to framing how we talk about difference in general, whether it's race or otherwise. And so Courageous Conversation Protocol has three different parts. One part is the four agreements, and that's really how we talk about race. You know, we want to be making sure that people feel and stay engaged and experience discomfort and speak their truth and understand that this is not a checklist. Um, it's not going to be something like, hey, we talked about that last semester, now it's over, we're gonna do something new. Uh, this is work that is ongoing and should be part of the, what you do every single day. And the six conditions is what we talk about. And I think that's really, really important. Are we talking, what we talk about is the work that we're doing. So all of those six conditions, and this is in a handout, um, you can also follow along on your PowerPoint on your phones or your laptops if you have them. But the six conditions is what we talk about. Each of these six uh, conditions can be formed into questions that are really important when you're doing the work. So are we isolating race? We can talk about poverty. We can talk about other intersects of identity, which are very, very important. And we need to centralize this, race, this work around race. Am I staying personal, local, and immediate and talking about myself, using I statements and not collective we statements? Because when you say we, a lot of the times, that doesn't include me as a black woman and how I enter the space. So thinking about who am I talking about and if you're gonna use that collective language, be specific so people know who are the they that you're talking about, who's the we that we're talking about. That's really important in framing the conversation. Um, making sure that we are normalizing multiple perspectives and thinking about social constructs. Race is a social construct and it has real life consequences for people of color in our society historically and modern day. So we need to make sure that yes, race is simultaneously fake and very real at the same time. And how are we seeing whiteness at work? Who are the people that make up uh, our school districts and who are the students and where might those cultural understandings come into play and thinking about how we um, envision what is unacceptable behavior or any of those things that we talk about in our PLC meetings. And um, lastly, thinking about using a working definition of race. When I say race, what am I talking about? When you say race, what are you talking about? And making sure we're coming together and normalizing those multiple perspectives that come into play. So that's the six conditions, what we're talking about when we talk about race. Lastly, the third part of the protocol is this compass and it is my favorite part because it kind of makes me become more self-aware about where I am and where I'm entering a conversation and all of this protocol can be used with anyone who doesn't know the protocol, which is really, really great. I know some of us aren't able to go to PEG's Beyond Diversity 1 or Beyond Diversity 2, and a lot of people in the classroom can't make that happen. Yet, for those of us who are familiar with this protocol, we can use it and operate in it every single day, even with folks who have not yet heard about the protocol. And so what this compass is trying to do is that we have kind of four quadrants that we enter this conversation in and the goal is to make sure we come together in the middle with courageous conversation, a productive conversation about race. 
So what do I believe? What do I feel? What am I thinking that then allows me to act? And we have to make sure that we understand who we are as people. You know, that first slice of the pie that Andrielle talked about in uh, the model to inform culturally responsive practices, I need to be aware of who I am and my educator identity of my own personal beliefs, my own perspectives about race, the implicit bias that I might hold, and how that, that really colors how I interact with other people. And so that's kind of the, the three parts of Glenn Singleton's Courageous Conversation Protocol. So what does that actually look like when you're doing it? As district equity coach, I really talk about race and culture and how that influences the classroom and what that means for teachers and staff um, and students alike in our organizations, in our institutions. And so when I was thinking about all of the, I, I come across so many different scenarios and I wanted to give life to two specific instances, both with black girls, one in first grade and one in 12th grade. And I think that really kind of accentuates that this doesn't just live in, um, in high school where we think kids you know, have the ability to talk about some of these harder conversations. It can, it can extend to 4K all the way up until we're living our adult lives. It, it really is important that we have space and hold space for these conversations. And so the first example, uh, I was in a first grade classroom and the teacher, uh, she had called me in, it was kind of before people really knew my position, and so I got the call of, you know, these black girls in my classroom could really use a positive role model. And I was like, okay, all right, all right, well, we're gonna talk about this, we're gonna talk about my position, and um, I'm gonna make sure that I nurture this relationship with this teacher. And so um, I came in, I did a little bit of observation, and she thanked me, and she brought one little black girl in, in particular, and remember this is first grade, she brought her outside of the classroom. I was standing outside of the classroom. She pats her on the shoulder, and she goes, thank you so much for being here for my friend today. You know, she's been having a lot of trouble making friends. She's pretty aggressive and has trouble being nice. And so I stood there, and I'm like, okay, there's so much to unpack in that statement and understanding that this was, um, you know, she was standing right there, um, a little baby being told that she is, she's mean, she's aggressive, and she's not nice, and that's why she doesn't have friends, right? And so I thought, and I said, you know, I, I, I really had a good time with you today. Thank you for showing me your classroom, um, and I thank the teacher. And at that moment, I didn't talk about it. Uh, I created space later. I sent her a little email, and I said, hey, I would love to talk more about um, some of the language that was used today, specifically the word aggressive. I'm wondering if we could take some time to talk about this. And sometimes I don't get a reply to those emails, and so I have to keep trying. She replied to me, um, and she was pretty escalated. You know, it turned into, uh, how dare you insinuate that I am treating my black students differently in my classroom? Um, I didn't know that aggressive was used as a, as a blanket term and all of these different things. And so I said, okay. So we're meeting two days later, and I was like, I was hopeful I was gonna go into the room, and you know, she would be de-escalated. In fact, she was here. And so when I thought about the compass, I knew she was coming in from that emotional quadrant. And I had some time to cool off because when she said aggressive to this little first grade girl, I was in the emotional quadrant. And so I had two days to think about how do I build my capacity in all of these other areas to then act and lead a conversation, a courageous conversation with this educator. And so we came together and we talked about the importance of language and what that means. And had we not talked about that, it wouldn't have led to a conversation about some of the misconceptions and misunderstandings she had about the apartment right next to the school that the little girl lived in, the misconceptions about her family not caring about education, and the rant that she went on about police brutality and how perhaps, you know, she thinks that right away, if you comply, then nothing's gonna happen, nothing's gonna happen. And so it led to some deeper conversations that I never would have uncovered had I not just asked a question and stayed curious um, and moved out of that emotional quadrant that I was in. <laughs> I was kind of fuming, because that was me. That's, that's me. I went through the school district that I'm, I'm coaching in right now. And 
I, it just brought me back. So I had to really, really work to get out of that space solely. I could be emotional. I could think about my emotions and how that informed what I believed and what I thought and how I was going to act. But I knew I needed to move from that quadrant solely into the other ones to have a productive conversation. And so that's not a, a conversation that ended that day. I'm still building a relationship with this educator and I'm still working on building her capacity to create change and to, to really deconstruct some of the implicit bias that she has when it comes to seeing black kids fighting at her elementary school and the thoughts that she came up with. And it's hard, it's hard work. My other example is a 12th grade girl that I love dearly. She is such a leader. Um, and this, this was a project that she was so passionate about. She's like, you know what, Ms. Talbert? I think that we need to have a black history project and the whole school is gonna see this. <laughs> the whole school needs to see it. And we made it happen, um, not without some hurdles. You know? So she, she sent out this um, optional survey to all of the student body. And she got almost 700 responses. Some of them that we had to throw out <laughs> because uh, you know, when, you, when you send out a survey, there are those people who can be goofballs and whatever. So we had to throw out a couple, um, but she had 12 questions, 12 mandatory questions on that survey. Do you believe racism exists at Fond du Lac High School? Do you believe racism exists in the community? Where have you seen racist acts being performed at our school? How have you responded? Um, all of these different questions where she got some beautiful, beautiful data. And we put that together in a presentation. And so she took four days um, presenting ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade at separate times in our big auditorium. And it was amazing. Just the way that she decided that this is something that everyone needs to hear. This is the first time this was done, too. And think about that, too. That's kind of sad. You know, this is the first time that we're having a black history project at our high school that's for everybody. Everybody's gonna learn about this. And there were some really positive views about that. She had kids and adults alike coming up after the presentation saying thank you so much. And there was one in particular that made her cry. It was a white boy at school. I don't remember what grade level he was in, but he came up and said, I used racial slurs and now I understand why that is wrong and why it's so painful and why it's so hurtful. And she started crying. And yet, I understand that that was not everybody's experience, right? So we had some adults and kids alike who came, came and was like, that's racist. Uh-uh, that's not okay. The things that she was saying, not okay. And I had one educator um, in particular who reached out to me about that. And this was actually, he heard word of mouth, like, um, so I'm hearing teachers and students talk about this racist presentation. I wasn't able to come, can you send it to me? Woo, okay, that's a big assumption to make when you didn't even see the presentation yourself. So I sent him the link and we got a chance to sit and talk about it. And of course, you know, uh, me being a black woman in a primarily white school um, in district and city, I was, again, found myself in that emotional quadrant of what? 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 Okay. And so this is really personal work and I encourage you all to keep doing it and think about how this protocol can be useful for you. So we talked about what is racist? What does that mean? Why did people, why did you view this as being racist? And it was a hard conversation and there was a lot to unpack and I just really encourage everyone to um, stay curious and ask questions, even when it's hard. And I think the most important thing from these stories is understanding that when we talk about safe spaces, safe spaces does not mean that we are comfortable. Safe, for me, looks different than safe for everybody else in this room. Yet, I want to encourage everyone to think about what a brave space looks like being brave, being courageous, and talking about all of these things that might bring about some really emotional um, things in our past. Uh, things that we've learned, things that we've had to unlearn, and I really want you all to just move forward and think about if I don't ask these questions, 
if I don't stay curious, if I stay silent, what are the repercussions for everybody else in this larger system? So thank you. Savannah. So we um, have heard some real life stories around what it means to use some of these protocols. And where we want to take you next is, I, I want to first talk about how what the story that she told, how it aligns to the model to inform. So there were some times in her stories where self-awareness self was evident, where examining the system's impact on students and families, where how do you demonstrate that you believe all students will learn? Understanding unique identities and worldviews, accepting institutional res responsibility, utilizing practices and curriculum that honor students' cultures. So I wanted to bring that back to the model to inform and have you just really on your own think about the alignment. What does it mean to be culturally competent? It means engaging in these deep conversations. Shavana just told us, don't stop or begin have the conversations that help us fully understand our culture as well as the cultures of the students and families that we serve, and then also take, taking us a little bit deeper into the race conversations. Also, what does it mean to be culturally competent? We're gonna move into our protocol that has five aspects to it, and those five aspects are stopping, and thinking about if the problem that you are having is uh, really built around race and culture, reflecting, again, with the same question, respecting when you do find those differences, but also respecting how you might go about bridging to some of the students and families that we serve that might be a little bit farther away from who we are, responding to the problem, and then also considering all the information that's being given around the problem solving process. And so in order for us to be more explicit about what this looks and sounds and feels like, we're going to show you a video of a team that is actually going to be using these five steps, stopping, reflecting, respecting, responding, and considering. And when we're, we're gonna ask you when the video is over to think about where you saw some of those five steps, so, so be watching the video with that in mind. To preface what the conflict was that we've been discussing in here is I just, um, with positive intent, came to my peers and said that uh, sometimes I don't quite know how to resolve or even initiate resolving a discipline issue or a conflict with a student of color, particularly a black student in my class. Um, I. Uh, April began, we started talking kind of about does it have to do with the low income poverty threat and it might vary well but when it all boils down as Howard had said, um, sometimes I may stray away from a conflict with a student of color, with a black student because I'm not quite sure how they're going to react. Are they going to pull the race card? Are they going to get defensive? Why are you coming down on me? Why aren't you talking to somebody else? And sometimes I'm scared or unsure of how to handle that type of a uh, uh, confrontation and so I might tend to avoid that mm -hmm. and just maybe let it go or not push the issue as much as I should. So that's kind of the conflict that we've been talking about here. Well, and as we consider the solutions we definitely don't, you know, we think of could we be passive and just allow that behavior to continue. If we don't curtail the behavior then we're almost kind of giving life to it and allowing it to thrive and then to con continue to go on. And, when we began to delve deeper to ask, is it a question of poverty or is it, you know, the race or ethnicity? And I could only bring in a point of reference mm -hmm. from, you know, children mm -hmm. that, you know, based on our experience and what we've discussed here and just gauging our interactions, I could not see one of our children responding to you that way. So it began to be more of, is it a question of how these children are socialized? and not necessarily so much as connected to their race. So just wondering, you know, considering the possible mm -hmm. solutions, we have to really look at what the root of the problem is. Mm -hmm. and, and not to soften it, to say, no, you know, yeah. if it is, right. you know, that it's right. black students, it is that. Mm -hmm. if, if there's something else that we need to look into, then there are other factors that are going mm -hmm. to layer it differently. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Right, but I think the, basically the issue that she's having is not so much the student, but it's what she's... That's the problem. You know, her, my, her, my, her culture, my trepidation, what, what she's my bringing, trepidation what she's in, in initiating to the, table, the conflict in the first place. Not even taking into consideration yes. the student. It's like, okay, mm-hmm. you know, her, uh, I guess her view of, I guess, black kids that are going to act crazy, okay, I don't want to get in a situation where I got to say maybe this thing blows out of hand mm-hmm. and some parents come here and they're going right. off on me and they're saying, oh, you've been racist and all that. She's trying to avoid that. She's, right. It's avoidance. Yes. yes. Mm-hmm. And Howard, if you think about it and you think about our district, which is uh, one of the most culturally diverse districts in Michigan, yet if you look at our staff, it is white mm-hmm. and it is middle class. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so if we're both voicing that we have had these thoughts and we've had these anxieties. First time that we've voiced this, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. you're not going to voice that at a staff meeting no, because you just don't say that. that at a staff meeting but chances are, the record would go, <laughs> yeah, you know, and everybody would like, <laughs> yes. Chances are, right. though, we are all yes, right. feeling that way. <clears throat> and we were talking earlier about that idea of. And, and I've been guilty of it myself. Well, I, I'm not comfortable with this, and so I'm going to avoid it. But in avoiding the situation, you're really avoiding the student. And you're losing that connection. And once that connection is lost, the teaching is lost. And the student will likely lose respect for you. Yes, definitely. And your other students who aren't giving you problems will lose respect for you, too. Because if they see how you deal with the situation and you're avoiding and you're you know, kind of like, I'm just not going to touch that, yeah. then they're looking at you like, well, what's up with that? Don't you I, care? You know, right, don't you care? Right. You know, and the main thing we talked about was being firm and being consistent right. with every student, regardless yeah. of race, uh, SES, mm-hmm. sex, um, uh, everything. Yes. Mm-hmm. Being firm and being consistent. Mm-hmm. That's why conversations like this are so important, though, and, and that's the big aha moment from this is that it is okay to talk about it and it is okay to be honest about it and once that step is taken then mm-hmm. it's a feeling like you know I, I feel better even just admitting my anxiety yeah. in the yeah. first place and moving like right. upwards from that point right. yeah just that opportunity to be tra- transparent mm-hmm. to say this is it to put it on the table right. and, and to move on from there right to allow that experience to really shape what your next interaction with those students will be. That's why I felt it was so important to not say low SES, but just say, hey, you're a black kid. Mm-hmm. And just, I, mean, cause, I mean, it is what it is. You know, like, we're supposed to be truthful and honest, you know, mm-hmm. and like, so nobody's being offended or anything like right. that. But right. uh, uh, definitely, uh, you know, moving forward, obviously, mm-hmm. like Stephanie said, as long as you're, as long as you're being fair, mm-hmm. you know, because it's unfair to say somebody that's not of color, like say a mm-hmm. white kid, mm-hmm. if they see, oh, she's been harder on me than she is on this kid because mm-hmm. of your fears. Mm-hmm. So that's not fair to them. So mm-hmm. firm, firm but fair. Mm-hmm. I think in considering the multiple perspectives of everyone involved, it really it takes us back to, as you know, Sonia says. Perhaps I am, you know, part of this. And so by you addressing the fact that, you know what, the opportunity for me to actually change this and be an agent of change to say that this is not acceptable to, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in Mm -hmm. essence, kind of confront your own fear, Mm -hmm. then you're no longer being a part of that problem. Mm -hmm. You're actually working to Mm -hmm. resolve whatever Mm -hmm. that conflict is. Mm -hmm. And when I think about it from the perspective of a black student who wasn't giving you problems, you know, Mm -hmm. there's that respect again. Mm -hmm. Because I'll look at you like, well, you know, are you afraid of them? And Mm -hmm. is it a black thing? Mm -hmm. You know, is it a black white thing? Is it that you're going to treat all black kids like this or, Mm -hmm. you know, something like that? And then from the perspective of of a white student or a white parent, like Howard said earlier, you know, they might say, well, hey, wait a minute. Why is this kid getting away with something and my my Mm -hmm. child did it and and they got five days out of school? Mm -hmm. So I think it's like you say, it doesn't matter the race, the sex, or the age. I, I, in my classroom, my kindergarten classroom, I have kids that do something and if I don't respond quickly and in the same manner, they, they start saying, and why he did it? And yeah. why she did yeah. it? And why yeah. did she, I, I didn't you yeah. respond in the same way? So you're going to listen right away if you don't respond. I think in that part of the classroom, you have to be the teacher, you have to be the boss. Right, yeah.
take control. That goes back to that firmness and that consistency yes. across the board. Kathy's going to take us through our number six. It's our second number six. <laughs> so um, this is from the work of Elena Aguilar. And as you know, um, I'm one, like I said before, I'm one of the leadership and coaching trainers for the Wisconsin RTI Center. And we use Elena's other book. Um, but this one, uh, her The Art of Coaching Teams, she has a protocol in here with these six steps. And again, when we're thinking about protocol work, especially as adults, we are doing some self-management work. And that's what she's really referring to here. Ground yourself. Know where you sit. And um, Andrell just talked about and Shivana about the quadrant. So you could certainly ground yourself using those. Return to your team norms. Identify the conflict or the impasse. What is it? Like call it, name it. Decide when to address it. Now might not be the time. You heard Shivana's second story where she, no, first story where she came back a couple days later. Timing is important. And if necessary, if it's that egregious, address it in the moment. But then once you're done addressing it, let it go. I'd also like to say to you all, we're talking about protocols within courageous conversations, but start with the low-hanging fruit. <laughs> Don't start with this. This is pretty high stakes, right? So first, get people used to using protocols. That's a skill in and of itself. And then start with some um, easier or lower uh, stress pieces, like we're gonna use a protocol to determine our norms for our team, okay? And then once you start moving towards that, then you can get into things that are a little higher stakes like race. But the point is, is to don't let it go. Move toward that within your processing. And now Shavana's gonna share and wrap us up. So I really love, can you hear me? I really love this nine healthy ways to communicate uh, by Lee Munwa. And I'm not gonna go through all of these. This is a handout for you. But I wanted to take you through just a couple that through those two stories that I shared, you might hear them overlap uh, with some of the courageous conversation protocol work that I had talked about. But the first one is reflect on what's being said and use their words and not yours. A lot of times, we put words in other people's mouths, uh, that, and that's not what they said. So making sure that's, that's just one simple thing that we can do is use their words and not ours, and stay curious with that too. So I heard you say this. Is that what you meant? And that gives them a chance to think about, yes, that's what I meant, or no, and then give them a chance to clarify. And that's just one really simple thing that really helps. Another one, well, I said be curious um, and being open, but number four, notice what they're saying and what they're not saying. And I think that's huge in some of the conversations that we have in education. We say a lot and we also don't say a lot. We use coded language for things. And so just being curious about what are people saying, what might be some unintended consequences of that saying, of what they're saying, what are some mental mindsets that might be holding us back from really seeing the change that we want to see. Another one that I think is really important to highlight is notice how you're feeling and be honest and authentic about it. Speak your truth, your own truth, and encourage those around you to speak their truth and you'll get such a long way with that. And lastly, focus on the relationship. I know a lot of times in education, we're like, we need a solution, we need a solution, and sometimes we lose that relational part of things, especially when we're talking about hard subjects like race or culture or any identity that we have. We have to make sure that we focus on the relationship because we're gonna have to see each other the next hour or the next day. And if we lose that trust, it's gonna be really hard for us to do the work that is necessary to move all of our kids forward. So these are just nine ways um, from Lee Munwa, but they're really, really great ways, simple ways to better engage with our colleagues and better engage with our students too. So we threw a lot at you today. Um, as Kathy said, this race talk is high stakes. 
And there's a lot to unpack and there's a lot to think about when we are engaging in difficult, courageous conversations. So I just want you to take this away. You don't have to turn and talk, but think about as you leave here today and as you go on to do whatever it is that you're gonna do for the rest of the night, go to the water park. Uh, sorry for those of you who are viewing virtually. Uh, <laughs> What squares with your thinking? What is something that you're like, I absolutely resonate with that and that is awesome. Thank you so much for bringing that to the forefront again. But also what is something that might be circling around in your head? Something maybe that we said that gives you pause and that's okay. Recognize it and lean into that discomfort that it might've given you and push through it and, and do some uh, thinking about why it is that you're feeling that way. And lastly, we gave you lots of protocols, lots of research. What's one that you absolutely want to remember and take with you and back to your teams when you get back to your buildings in your district? What is one thing that you're going to be like, yeah, this is going to be in my repertoire when I get back and I'm going to show these folks, like, yeah, we're going to do this work. So thank you so much for being here with us this afternoon. I know it's a little... It's late, people are ready to go, but if you could please, please, please fill out this survey, tell us what you thought, because we really value your feedback and want to find ways to make this better. Thank you again. Oh, and there are paper copies. <laughs>